This happened when I was four or five years old. I was at a rather large toy store with my dad and sister, who was two years older than me, so that I could pick out a birthday present for a friend of mine. My dad and I were looking at the Lego they had available, while my sister was shuffling around, bored out of her mind. At some point, she wandered away. I was looking at the box of a castle set, wishing that it was my birthday coming up, when my sister returned and tugged on my dad's arm. What is it, sweetheart? He asked, without looking away from the box he was holding. I think he also wished it was his birthday coming up. There is a man. Oh, never mind, he's gone now. My dad looked at her putting the box back on the shelf. What man? He asked. There was a man who asked if I wanted to come and see his puppy, and I said that I had to ask you first, but I don't know where he went. My dad took the box out of my hands and put it back on the shelf, then took my hand in his and put his other hand around my sister's shoulders. Well, let's go find him, my dad exclaimed, and began leading us towards the checkouts and exit. Now, like I said, this toy store was rather large, and we were walking very fast. My sister pointed at a man who was just about to leave the store and said, That's him. I could see how she recognized him from behind, as he had very long hair, and it went halfway down his back. I remember him having a black winter coat on, which was strange because it was a pretty warm day. We walked even faster until we were at the nearest checkout, and my dad said to us, Stay here with this nice lady for a sec, referring to the cashier. He then ran up behind the man, who was now almost out the door, and threw his hand on his shoulder so hard that I could hear it. My dad spun him around to face him, then began yelling. Where's the puppy? Where is this puppy that you wanted to show my daughter? People around the store started looking over at the commotion, and my dad continued. You wanted to take my daughter to see your puppy? Where is it? I want to see the puppy too. The man was stammering and stuttering, and trying to get away but my dad had a firm grasp on the guy's shoulder. Turning his head to where we were standing, my dad yelled to my sister, Is this the guy who asked you to come see his puppy? My sister silently nodded her head, then looked at her shoes. I think she thought she was in trouble. I didn't blame her. Our dad was yelling really loudly at this point. Is the puppy in your car? Where is your car? Is that it over there? He pointed out the glass door into the parking lot. I remember thinking that if he just let go of the guy, he could lead us to the puppy. Before I knew it, three men in yellow jackets had come. There was a word on their jackets, which I couldn't read, though I knew all of the letters. S-E-C-U-R-I-T-I. Security. My dad let go of the man, and the yellow jacket fellows held him instead. My sister was crying by this point. My dad walked back to us, once again taking my hand in one of his own and putting the other around my sister's shoulders. He asked the cashier if she had a phone that he could use, and she took us to the office. He called our mum to come pick us up, then assured my sister that she was not in trouble. In fact, she was in the last amount of trouble anyone has ever been in the history of the world, simply by coming and asking for his permission to see the puppy. I asked my dad if we were still going to see the puppy, and he just looked at me and said, Sorry son, the puppy ran away. Our mum came in just a few minutes later, and as we were leaving there, the police arrived. Are they going to help find the puppy, dad? My sister asked. No, they're here for something else. The other day, after reading through a lot of the stories on Reddit, I remembered this incident and asked my dad about it. Apparently, when the cops searched his car, they found rope, duct tape, a knife, pliers, and a hacksaw. At the guy's apartment, they found a whole shitload of child pornography. My dad and sister testified at his trial, and the guy got 20 years, which means, barring other circumstances, he's out now. The year was 1995, and I was 16 years old. I lived in a three-bedroom, two-bath house in a middle-class suburban community with my mother, two younger brothers, and our 140-pound Doberman Turbo. From the front door of our house, you could see directly into our living room, which had an open concept floor plan, and with the kitchen and dining room. Our couch was on the wall directly in front of the front door. 
and it was the summer between my sophomore and junior years in high school. My brothers and I spent a decent amount of time outdoors, because this was back when people did that. I suppose anyone paying attention knew who lived in a house, and I suppose they knew that the only adult was gone when the only car was gone. However, prior to the man showing up at the house, I had never noticed anything off, and I never noticed anything afterwards, so maybe we were just a random target. It was a Saturday, and mum and the boys had run to the grocery store. In Nevada, in the 90s, almost no one had air conditioning. So, to cool off, you would open all the windows and doors and use fans. On this particular day, I had the backsliding door and front door wide open to get a cross breeze. Neither screen door was locked. I was napping on the couch in full view of the front door in shorts and a tank top, with unlocked doors. It's good we gain intelligence with age. In my defense, there was 140 pounds of protective dog muscle on the floor next to me, and probably only for that reason am I alive. Around the approximate time that I expected my family home from the store, Turbo began barking. Assuming that he was barking at their arrival, I told him to shush and tried to go back to sleep. Turbo, God bless his sweet protective soul, continued to bark, becoming more and more intense and even aggressive with his barking. Finally, after 5-10 to ten minutes of Turbo refusing to be quiet and my family never coming in from the car, I sat up, realizing something was seriously wrong. A man, who I didn't know, stood, seemingly frozen, staring at my frenzied and barking Doberman. Assuming that the man had some appropriate business at my home, I hurried the 10 steps to the unlocked screen door, constantly shushing Turbo. I apologized for my dog and for not hearing his knock. He never knocked, by the way. The man explained that he was from the phone company and he was here to check our lines. He never took his eyes off Turbo. Turbo never stopped snarling. I leaned forward far enough to see the street. Only unmarked, privately owned cars lined the street. I looked at the man who was dressed in tennis shoes, jeans and a t-shirt. I was 16 and dumb enough to nap in front of an unlocked door. But I was no fool. Phone company personnel, A, always wear uniforms, B, always drive company vehicles, C, don't come without being called, and D, do not work on weekends. I looked at the man, who had yet to look up from the 140 pound dog that was now foaming at the mouth. I grasped the screen door handle and held it. This got his attention. He met my eyes as I said, you have 30 seconds to show me identification, or I open this door. I don't even think he made an incoherent excuse as he ran away. I fell to my knees and hugged Turbo. I then gave him all the meat in the fridge. I believe, with absolute certainty, that I would have been attacked if we hadn't had him. I like to think that if I hadn't had a huge, overly protective dog, I would have been in the habit of locking doors. But what would a screen door latch do against an intruder anyway? And that creep stood there and watched me for 5-10 to ten minutes. Perhaps he was paralyzed in fear. But maybe he was working out his angles and only Turbo's insistent display of his willingness to kill anyone who threatened me changed his mind. That's my theory. Turbo has long passed, but his legacy lives on. I visited my cousin a few towns over as she needed some help from me. I spent a rather long time at her place. We finished our stuff a few hours later but as we don't see each other often, she wanted me to stay for a bit more and so I did. And that bit ended up being two hours so I left her house in the dark. This didn't really bother me as much at the time as I've never been afraid of the dark and I always carry some maze around with me, always, just in case. I went to the train station and started to wait for my train. I put on my headphones and just looked at my phone, reading through my messages and stuff like that. Suddenly, I felt someone sit next to me. It was a middle-aged man. He was bold and quite tall and skinny. I didn't give him much attention until he touched my shoulder and smiled at me. He started to talk, but as I had my headphones on, I couldn't hear what he was saying. I pulled one of my earphones out and looked at him. Excuse me? His smile widened as I had given him my attention. That smile was really disturbing. 
His eyes seemed as if he wanted to kill me or something. He then pulled his hand away from my shoulder and placed it near my thigh instead. I asked, where was the pretty girl like you headed? I was really confused. Why would he ask that? I was already breaking my mother's rule by talking to a strange man, so I didn't want to cross the line any further and speak to this guy. I decided to just lie instead. I'm going to Tallinn. He smiled even wider at that. His smile was really making me nervous at this point. Why wouldn't he just stop smiling was the question that ran through my mind. I'm going there as well. I nodded and stayed quiet until the train arrived a few minutes later. I quickly went to the area where there were more people. I luckily didn't see him follow me in. I sat down, took my phone out and started looking at random YouTube videos. I was already feeling a lot better. I stayed like this until I had to get off. I got off at my actual stop and started walking home. I was humming quietly to my songs until I felt eyes burning into my back. I turned around and there he was. That freaking creep was smiling widely at me and starting to quicken his steps. I quickly broke into a run. I'm not an athlete but I can run for a long period of time if needed. I could hear him talk behind me. I didn't pay much attention to it as the only thought running through my mind was to run. Beauty, stop running and let's have some good time. I quickly took out my maze just in case, holding it tight in my hand. I knew that it would be very useful if he caught up to me. I already saw the town lights in the distance. I knew that if I could get there, then I would be safe. I screamed out loudly when he caught up with me and grabbed my hand. I did the first thing in my mind and let him taste some of my maze. He screamed out in pain and let go of me. I used that chance to run again as I was already very tired at that point but I didn't really care. I knew that I had to run and that's exactly what I did until I got home. I broke down crying when I got home and explained everything to my parents through my tears. My mum held me and wiped my tears away letting me stay home for a day to collect myself a bit. I can only imagine what that creep wanted to do to me, and I feel glad to be still here today. I was living in my first apartment post-college with my fiancé and my Siamese cat. My fiancé works nights sometimes, and my little Siamese was the chillest, meekest little thing. The apartment was the top floor of a rehabbed house. It had once been an attic. All the walls were angles and the windows were in the eaves. The front door was at the bottom of a flight of steep wooden stairs and opened onto the external concrete landing at the back of the house. The back of the house was a wooded lot with some other houses nearby, but none in direct line of sight. I was used to my boyfriend coming home late. I would be dead asleep when I'd hear his key in the lock and his feet coming up the wood stairs. One night... My tiny little shadow of a Siamese cat took to meowing. I could hear her sitting at the bottom of the stairs where the door opened, meowing every few seconds in a soft, questioning but very, very insistent way. Just barely insistent enough to bring me half awake at 2.45 to 3am. I was laying there wondering what the hell is happening and I couldn't even form coherent thoughts just vaguely registering the meowing in the completely dark house in a stupor sleep state. Then, I heard it. The doorknob at the foot of the stairs was turning, gently. Someone was outside on the back stoop, in the dark, unobservable from the street, gently twisting the knob this way than that. I could barely hear them doing it. I wasn't 100% sure I was hearing it correctly. Then, they tried again, twisting softly, pushing gently. As the door barely moved in the jab, then twisting the knob this way and that way again, very persistent. I shot up 100% wide awake. I sat up in bed, gently put my feet on the floor, and my cat raced up the stairs and sat down and looked at me, like, finally, human, come on, do something. She was completely silent after that. I stepped quietly onto the floor, called my boyfriend to ask if he was trying to get in the back door, and lost his keys or something. He said no, 
and he wasn't even in the same state as he was on an overnight delivery driving. He said hang up, call 911 right away, get the handgun, turn on every light in the house but stay away from the windows, and to call him right back and remain on the phone with him until the cops arrived. I immediately acted. The door rattling stopped, and the cops came. They kind of beat the bushes in a circle around the house, said it was probably just a homeless person trying to get in from the cold. When both our downstairs neighbours and my fiancé were away? Maybe, but still. It's not like it would take days of super sleuthing to connect one car to me, the other cars to the others, and deduce that there was a woman there home alone. They said that they would increase the patrols on the street for the night. My fiancé raced home an hour and a half early from his night's delivery run, and also circled the house, yard and lot on foot. Until that night I had never known my sweet little Siamese was actually a guard cat in disguise. I'd heard stories of cats walking their families up in fires or carbon monoxide situations, but figured those were already aggressive, extroverted and attention-seeking type cats. My meek little scaredy little cat would disappear when people came over and was like a little unseen shadow, but threw down that night in her own way. A little background on the events I'm going to write about. This all happened in mid-October. My family owns about 160 acres out in the middle of nowhere. Closest neighbour is a friend who we allowed to rent the pasture for his cattle when he needs to. Some friends and I decided that we wanted to build a little cabin out there that we would hang out at. So, one weekend, one of my friends and I loaded up a tractor that we were renting from his dad and headed out there. It was just me and him that weekend as everyone else was busy. We got there a little late since it took a while to get everything loaded and packed for the weekend. He went about setting up our tent and I made our fire. As I did so, I made an old discovery. There was a phone book from a few towns over, still in its plastic sleeve, right next to our fire pit. I picked it up and showed it to my friend. We both enjoyed scaring ourselves and I made the comment that we aren't alone out here. And we both laughed at it. Later that night, we're sitting around the campfire talking and BSing. There was a big bright moon that night and a bit of a breeze, which made whatever leaves were left rustle. It was a little creepy, but we enjoyed the atmosphere. We noticed, however, someone crossing the middle of the field, their body just visible from the moonlight. At first, it was a little odd. My friend and I discussed for a few seconds if we should confront him, but I made the suggestion that he was probably just taking a shortcut across the field. Although I didn't really like it, it wasn't a huge deal. If we caught him doing it again, then we'd confront him, we decided. The rest of the night passed pretty uneventfully. We eventually got in our tent and laid down. We were probably 20 or so feet from the fire pit, which was by that point burning quite low. We talked for a few minutes and then we got silent, trying to fall asleep. As we're laying there, we hear something. It sounded like quiet footsteps walking around the fire pit. We both look at each other in silence. Then, we hear a piece of wood get thrown in the fire and it flamed up quite a bit. I grabbed the shotgun I always keep in the tent and quickly racked it. We heard someone run away, but by the time we got out, they were too far away. The rest of the weekend was pretty quiet and the events of the first night seemed kind of dreamy to us. We just cleared out the area for the cabin and cut and stacked the trees we cut for the firewood. Next weekend, we get out there. My uncle was out there as well and went to check his game cams. This is where things got much more worrying for us. My uncle told us that he was pissed because someone had stolen the batteries and the SD cards out of the cameras. We told him about what happened the weekend before, and then parted ways. And when we got out there, we noticed that quite a bit of our wood that we had cut and stacked was already gone. And we were the last people to camp out there, which means someone had come out and had themselves a fire. We then went and checked on the tractor, on which we had left down there, we found it had been broken into, and the chainsaw which we left in the cab 
had been stolen. To make a long story short, nothing else so far has happened. I was hesitant for a few weeks to continue with the cabin, since we weren't there all the time. I was worried that it would be an incentive for whoever was out there to stay. I'm not sure what the hell is out there, but I hope we never meet them. I'm 25, female, and an exotic dancer, living in the Detroit area. This story takes place on my way home from work one night at 2am at the gas station near my house, about a week ago. My boyfriend needed to use my car. He dropped me to work and picked me up, so he was driving. There was a cop car parked right in front of the entrance, but other than that, we were the only customers. My boyfriend parked at the pump furthest from the entrance, and I got out to buy my cigarettes. As I walked in, I immediately almost bumped into a very tall, very buff police officer. He was standing in front of the cashier and talking very loudly, oblivious to the fact that the cashier had no idea what he was saying because he couldn't speak any English. It's okay, sweetie. Say, what are you? Like, where are you from? You look mixed. Guam, I said, annoyed but still courteous. I'm terrified of police, especially the Detroit cops. Guam? Love hookers there, yeah? He laughed. Uh, I wouldn't know. I, I was just a little girl. I mumbled, trying to move past him to the register to buy my smokes. He was blocking my way. Suddenly, he reached an arm out and placed it on the small of my back, and because I was wearing a short coat, he easily wriggled his hand underneath it and my shirt, touching my bare skin. Well, you're not a little girl anymore, eh? He was now pushing me slightly, guiding me back out the door. The way the store was set up, we were only a foot or so from the door. I was panicking a little bit, but because he was a cop, I didn't know how to react. I've been in plenty of similar situations without freezing up, but his authority really fucked with my head. I was so confused, I wasn't even sure what he was doing. We exited the store. His empty squad car was parked directly outside the doors. He was leading me towards it, talking loudly. I'm cruising alone tonight. I could jack off if I wanted to. I love riding alone. His voice was echoing loudly throughout the pumps. I was numb, but started dragging my feet a little, realizing how fucked up this really was. Suddenly, I heard a car door slam, and my boyfriend yelling my name. The cop's hand dropped away from my back and he beelined it back to his squad car without saying a word. Because of the way my car was parked behind the pump, the cop had not realized I wasn't alone. My boyfriend had the window cracked open just a little because he was smoking a cigarette and he heard the cop making creepy comments and then spotted me being led to the squad car. He said that I looked like a zombie. He had never seen me like that before and it freaked him out so bad that he slammed the car door called my name, and ran over to me. By the time he got to me, the cop had left and I had snapped out of it. I started crying. A million thoughts went through my mind. I was wearing heavy makeup because I had just left work. Maybe he thought I was a hooker. I hadn't stopped him. He probably thought that I wanted whatever it was that he wanted to do to me. I felt ashamed and embarrassed. My boyfriend did his best to console me. He even tried to ask the cashier for help but he spoke no English and just kept saying, No cops, no cops, please. He was probably illegal and I understand. He also had no idea what had just happened. I mean, I was there and I could hardly process it. In the end, we just went home and tried to forget about it. I've been avoiding that gas station and I never go out alone anymore. My heart stops for a second every time I see a Detroit cop behind me while I'm driving. So, I just got a new job back in October, working tech support on the graveyard shift. I work from 1am to 12pm Friday through Mondays. Needless to say, adjusting my sleep schedule has been quite the task, but I have managed. On the days that I don't work, I still follow my work schedule, waking up at midnight and staying up until at least 2pm before falling asleep as to keep my sleeping schedule in line with my work schedule. I bought blackout curtains to help with this, as trying to sleep with the sun shining is not easy for me. I usually require complete darkness. I live alone. 
I started noticing weird things happening around my apartment when I would get home from work or after waking up on days off. Just little things at first. Lights being on that I swear I turned off, doors being left open or closed. Just so everyone can get a bit of understanding about my apartment, I live on the second floor and my building is right behind the leasing office. The entrance to my apartment requires you to enter the building first, then there is a hallway with two apartments on either side, then you can enter the apartment. Each apartment has two deadbolts, one that you can unlock from the outside and another that requires you to unlock from the inside. There is also a balcony which faces east, complete with a large sliding glass door and screen. I use it quite frequently as I had potted plants out there, but have brought them inside due to cold weather. The picture on the screen now is the hallway doorway. My apartment is the one closest to the camera. I intentionally left out the number for obvious reasons. I also have two cats, Luna and Eclipse, who until recently lived with me. I'm moving soon and can't afford the pet deposit, so my parents offered to let them stay at their place for the time being. Eclipse is Luna's daughter and only six months old, so she follows her mum around all the time. I'd usually find them cuddled up together on my chair or bed, and recently they had trapped themselves in the bathroom. Now that they're not here, it had gotten harder to pass off these weird occurrences as my cats. Doors are still being left open and closed, and food has been disappearing from my fridge. At first, I passed this off as just me being my usual self, and just not remembering that I ate something when I was half asleep or bored. Recently, my boss gave me permission to work from home, as this shift is brand new as the company is moving to 24-7 support, and the building owner refuses to heat my floor for my shift for only two people. So, I've been doing that for the past couple of weeks, and just last week, I noticed the metal rod that acts as a secondary lock on the balcony door wasn't engaged, so I put it back. I didn't think much of it at the time, as my computer faces my balcony door, and I sometimes fidget with it with my feet while playing video games. On the 11th of December 2016, my credit card information was stolen and my account was charged $3,000 plus. I was in the office that day as a favour to my co-worker who was really creeped out being in the office alone in the middle of the night. The charge was made at 11.40am, just a few moments before I had gotten off work and I had the card on me still. This is relevant, I promise. I was restless and didn't sleep well. I wake up at midnight per usual on Monday morning and get my setup ready to take calls. Now, almost no calls come in on the weekends, so I'm usually screwing around on Reddit, Facebook, YouTube and Netflix. Around 3am, I was catching up on the 100 when someone unlocked my fucking door. I don't mean picked the lock, I mean used a key. Thank God the secondary deadbolt was engaged, but the person jiggled the door to try and to get it open. I ran and grabbed my gun, looked out the peephole, but saw nothing. I opened the door with the intent to shoot someone, but the person was already gone. Before you ask, yes, I called the cops. No, they didn't find anything. There are no cameras in the hallway of the building, or outside them for that matter, but they told me that there wasn't enough evidence for them to do anything about it, and they left. I didn't sleep at all the next night and decided to stay home. I didn't sleep at all the next night and decided to stay home on my days off to try and catch the person if they tried to come back. I also asked the leasing office if they handed out any extra keys to my apartment and they said no and then I informed them that I changed the locks on my door. You remember the picture from before showing my apartment door, the picture on the screen now? Well, the white door, just on the other side of the fire extinguisher, is my storage closet, open with the same key for the deadbolt. I keep my Christmas tree and decorations in there, and I decided that it was time to set it up. As I'm pulling out the tree this evening, it's only a 5 foot tall fake tree that has all the lights attached to it already, I noticed a bag, back behind it. A small black duffel bag. In it, I found a change of clothes, sunglasses, shoes, toiletries, and a notebook. What was in the notebook horrified me. 
There were notes about me, what hours and days I worked, notes about my cat, and also updated notes that the cat were no longer there, and the date as well. My credit card number was also there. As I went further and further back in the notes, I found two words, circled multiple times, balcony door. This is the picture that I took of the notebook and that specific page. I assumed that the balcony door is how the person entered my apartment for the first time. This creep had been living in my apartment while I've been at work for the past month, and I didn't even know it. The worst part is that I was in my apartment at the same time as this guy, at some point, and didn't even know it. That's the only way that he would have gotten my credit card number and my house key to make a copy somewhere. I've called the police and they're on their way over. I'm writing this as I'm waiting for them to show up. It's the only thing that keeps me sane right now. Plus, I think it will help me organize my thoughts so that I can best explain to the officers what has happened. I'll keep you guys updated as things progress. Update. So, I guess I should have noted I used to have a roommate. He joined the Navy a few months back. The cops think that the bag is his and was the one who tried to come in. The only problem with that is that he's in Florida, going through basic training. So, unless he lied about that in an attempt to not have to pay for rent anymore, I doubt that this is the case. They said that they would look into it and add it to my already open investigation on my credit card case. So these are the pictures of everything in the bag, the notebook, and inside the notebook. I took the photos after making the post initially while waiting for the cops to show up, just for my own records, since I'm a paranoid fuck. I blacked out my apartment number and the credit card number for obvious reasons. Update. So, the police got back to me. They confirmed that it wasn't my roommate. They contacted his recruiter and they confirmed that he's still in basic training. They also looked at the footage from the leasing office and nothing was found of anyone fleeing on foot. So, we assumed that he went out back and fled towards the light rail station next to my complex. They're gonna get hold of CDOT to pull the security footage from there. The only other thing that they said was, we will inform you if we find anything else. Final update. The police have identified the person who used my credit card information. They're going to try and see if there's any connection between the person who used my information and the person who left the bag behind.